Hello and welcome to this very special episode of the GCU COP26 Common Good podcast. My name is Professor Pamela Gillis, Vice Chancellor of Glasgow Caledonian University, and I am absolutely delighted to be joined today by GCU's Chancellor, humanitarian, climate and social justice campaigner and singer songwriter extraordinaire, Dr. Annie Lennox OBE, and the wonderful social activist and campaigner, Dr. Satish Kumar, to discuss the role that education plays in tackling the climate emergency, to discuss how our journeys, our individual journeys, have led us here, and what we need to see from COP26 happening in Glasgow right now. Dr. Lennox, Dr. Kumar, thank you so much for joining me on this Common Good Climate Emergency podcast. And the first question uh, to you is, you know, you are both longtime activists and social campaigners, but where did your passion for social activism, activism come from? Where did it originate? Can I ask you first, Annie, where did that wonderful passion you have come from? Well, you know, from my father's side of the family, we uh, were working class, uh, shipyard workers, socialists. There was a whole familial consciousness around the sort of injustice of, at that time, we always say capitalism. Now, of course, we've gone into this global corporate world. So one half of my family were very socially conscious. And actually, they were activists during the just you know in between the first world war and the second world war my grandparents were on the streets as as young social activists uh, working outside the factory gates handing out pamphlets fighting with fascists fascists that came up to scotland and were trying to um a sort of persuade working class people to join the fascist movement i found this out about my my grandparents later on so some of that uh, consciousness has come from this upbringing of hearing issues being discussed around the dinner table and, and all of that. And, and, it, and it was never really beaten into me. You know, it wasn't as if I was expected to pick up that baton, but somehow or another, there is something in the Lennox DNA <laughs> that, that is very, very aware of injustice. It's always been the case. I feel it in myself. I feel it in my bones. And it's just something that one lives with, actually. Baked in to you, Annie. It is, it is baked in. It's something you, that you cannot walk away from because it's just in your bloodstream. It's in your consciousness. And Satish, for you, social activism, where did that come from? For me, the inspiration came from, from UK. I was 26 years old, young man, sitting in a coffee house in Bangalore, and I read a piece of news that 90 year old, great philosopher, Nobel Prize winner, Lord Bertrand Russell was protecting against nuclear weapons. And not only protesting, but was sentenced to imprisonment. I was so flabbergasted and inspired at the same time. I said, he is a man of 90 going to jail for peace in the world. What am I doing, young man, sitting here drinking coffee? That was the inspiration. And, and on that very day, with a friend of mine, I decided to walk from India to Moscow, to Paris, to London, and to Washington, the four nuclear capitals of the world. And I walked 8,000 miles, and I walked without any money, and I met Bertrand Russell when I came to England. And so England, in a way, and Bertrand Russell was my inspiration to become an activist at age 26. My goodness, Kamar, you walked all that way. It's absolutely astonishing, inspiring many on the journey. But if we turn now to the climate emergency, uh, can I ask you to tell me, you know, about climate change as an issue? How did you, you really become aware of it? And how do you use your positions, if I might say, to advocate for climate action and climate change. So, Annie. Well, you know, I think that hippie movement of the 60s, the early 60s, brought a certain kind of social consciousness 
to the Western world, you know, and the young generation then. Now, I was too young, really. I was born in 1954. So I was only like, oh, I don't know, about 10 years old, something like that. And I started to become aware of a different set of values. And of course, you know, all the great Eastern teachers were, you know, Tibetan teachers were moving out, obviously, to, to India and to different countries because of the Chinese invasion and all of that. There are so many global shifts and changes that have taken place historically that have created this kind of extraordinary nebulous consciousness that finally kind of percolated down to a young Scottish kid, you know? And when I came down to London, in 1971, there was just something in the air where you picked up on everything. And I'm a person who has got a wide antenna for a lot of things. I'm not that educated in terms of university qualifications or anything like that. But something significant did happen to me. I must just bring this in. It's a beautiful story. Dave Stewart, my partner in Eurythmics, his stepfather was passionate about the glaciers melting and he had every book on the subject every line about it was underlined and on a Sunday he used to actually go with a placard down to Camden Lock and tell people look the ice ice caps are melting we are going to be flooded and it sounded very eccentric at the time mm. but then of course you knew that huge organizations were picking up on this like Greenpeace and save you know um uh, save the Earth and all the all these sort of uh, climate justice organizations have been working since the 60s and 70s that awareness that awareness has been there and it's usually the young generation actually that push these movements and that is why I am so passionate as a Chancellor of Glasgow Caledonian to encourage and inspire our students to actively take part in what needs to be an emergent, I mean, taught, this is a real serious global pending catastrophe. And I don't want to mince my words because we need to speak with this languaging. We cannot just hide it underneath the table anymore. We must speak candidly and I'm extremely passionate about our young generation. They must inherit the earth and it must be a good place for our children and grandchildren and future generations. Otherwise, we have no future here on this planet. So you are quite unusual, Annie, because you've actually spotted the climate emergency. You, you, you've understood it's, it's been there for some considerable time and you've been working for many years uh, on climate ac action. Um, and Satish, when did it be become something that you were focused on? Yes, um, I was although focusing on nuclear weapons in the 60s, but in the 70s, I became the editor of Resurgence magazine. And my friend, Teddy Goldsmith, started the Ecologist magazine. So between Resurgence magazine and Ecologist magazine, in the 70s and 80s, we campaigned about climate change already, even though at that time, this was a very minority interest issue. But Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, as Annie mentioned many things, uh, Ecologist and Resurgence magazine, together with Teddy Goldsmith and E.F. Schumacher, who wrote Small is Beautiful, we started that campaign. And now I feel that in the 21st century, the climate change had become the nuclear weapon of this time. What was height of Cold War in the 60s? And I walked against nuclear weapons. Now, if I was a young man, I will walk for uh, climate change from London to Paris, to Berlin, to Moscow, to Beijing, to Delhi and campaign because this is the nuclear weapon of 21st century. If we don't stop climate change and if we go on heating the, cli the climate and heating the earth, then we have no future. So I totally agree with Annie that we cannot miss our words. We have to campaign to stop this catastrophe which is facing the world. And Glasgow uh, COP26 is a wonderful opportunity for the world leaders and the population in general to come together, unite, forget all our narrow national interest, narrow religious differences, narrow political um, uh, differences and, and interest. We should must all unite together in order to uh, save our common home, the planet Earth. And that's so stirring, 
to hear, Satish. And I know you have both used your voices, your influence, in so many ways to raise your voices uh, against the climate emergency, to demonstrate what we can do to change the world, to avert the catastrophe uh, that you've both described. What role does education have? You know, making sure people understand the science, making sure that they, they understand what is fake news. What role do both of you see education as having? I believe it's transformative, it's really important. You would expect me to say that. But Annie, you know, what do you think we should be doing from an educational perspective now? Oh, that is such a big question and it's a wonderful question. Education is everything. Without education and a, a real uh, base of truth, you know, unfortunately we've come to this very strange, uh, with, with COVID-19, so many emergent issues have come through and one would actually almost say to the benefit. It's it's wonderful in a way that since the 1960s civil rights movement, for example, there was, a, you know, I always wondered like, what is happening with civil rights? It seems like a hell of a long time when I wanted to hear the African-American voice really come through and speak for social justice. Now with COVID and um, hashtag, hashtag Black Lives Matter, we've, we've had that voice coming through, but it always needs to be sustained. And what I've learned, and I'm sorry if I'm slightly diverging from your question, but I just want to say that, you know, one, one has a platform nowadays. It's an extraordinary thing that internet provides us with so much information. And yet again, there is so much polarization taking place and disinformation is a really, really complex thing to unpack. And so it is really important that we look to the sources of the education, whatever that might be, what are we listening to? What are we really understanding? And we have to sort of break it down as individuals. We have the responsibility to really check the source of what we are finding. And that is why I think that the universities and the colleges have a very, very strong potential in a way to guide young people into making the, the right kind of balanced decisions out of all the information that is flooding us. What is truth and what is untruth is very, very important for all young people. Well said. And Satish, we at our university embed our work on climate action within all the 17 sustainable uh, development goals of the United Nations, because all of the goals, no poverty, no hunger, gender equality, fair work, um, your good health and well-being, all of the goals are interconnected. And I just wondered what you felt about the role of education and climate action within the, this broader context. Yes, uh, I would like to first of all congratulate you, uh, Glasgow Caledonian University is one of the leading university to address these issues in our modern times. But in the rest of the world, most of our universities are still following the old educational system, which was designed for the industrial age in the 19th and 20th century. And all the problems we face today of climate change, social inequality and injustice, um, fossil fuel industry, um, big corporations emitting a lot of pollution and waste. They are all problems designed and led and created by highly educated people <laughs> from Harvard, from Yale, from Cambridge, from Oxford, from big, big universities of the world. They are running the show, which is polluting and wasting and creating climate change. Therefore, we have to say that the education system practiced around the world today is out of date. We have to have a new education. The old education is teaching young people to look at nature as if it was only a resource for the economy. That is a wrong education. Nature is more than a resource for the economy. Nature is life itself. Nature is source of life itself. And that we have to bring into our education and say, we are not here to conquer nature. We are not here to exploit nature. We are here to revere nature and live in harmony with nature. That nature-centered education 
has to be brought for the 21st century. And I think all our universities have become out of date. They are still training young people to go out in the world and get jobs which will pollute, waste, and create carbon emission, and create more global warming and climate change, and more social injustice. So I would say we have to be very radical, and your university is a prime example of uh, creating new path and new ways of education. So I would like to again congratulate you for your wonderful work. And I hope that your example can be uh, implemented and, and kind of be practiced by other universities so that we can bring nature, ecology, environment, social justice, uh, gender equality, all these issues are part of education and not just learning how to get a job, how to be successful. Our education is very egocentric. My success, my money, my job, uh, my um, status, my position, my um, reward, everything me, me, me. Our education has to change from me culture, me education to we education, yes. we culture. And that is the new challenge for our 21st century. Education is a part of the problem. We have to make education a part of solution. At the moment, education is part of the problem. Yeah. I I have to say, I agree with you. Uh, I think the tide is turning. Universities around the world are now making commitments to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. They still have to embed that commitment in real actions. But I'm, let's hope I'm delighted to hear that. And I hope that they can change more quickly and, and embrace the ecological paradigm and social justice paradigms more quickly. Uh, they will have to, uh, Dr. Kumar, because as you and Annie have pointed out, we are on the edge of a catastrophe here. Uh, these problems sometimes seem very large problems. They're systemic problems that only governments or big policymakers can change. Can I ask you just personally, in your own lifestyles, what have you done to change um, you know, your lifestyle to be more climate just? Annie, just one thing if, or two. Well, I have to, I'm going to be really honest and frank with you because I just don't want to be um, <clears throat> inauthentic, you know. It's very hard. It's yeah. very, very hard to, with, to live a life that is kind of out of a system that, that millions of other people um, <clears throat> and I, I have no other choice but to adhere to. I mean, there are plenty of things one can do. I'm living here in America. And I mean, everything is plastic, no matter where you go, everything that you touch, you know, from the moment that you go into your bathroom, you're using hair products and all manner of things. And to be quite frank, it, it haunts me because I feel like I don't personally know how to really change a system that is all around me. And in the last <clears throat> two, well, almost two years, it's 18 months, isn't it, that we've had more, this COVID uh, phenomena has affected us. I mean, Amazon has come through and has been, uh, I know this is, I'm just being really honest with you. I'm not going to lie and say that, that uh, oh, well, I'm a survivalist now and everything I do is I have a cow and I milk and I, have, you know. One thing I do though, one thing I do is that I, I have become vegetarian. And I think that that's a good one because, um, and that does make a huge difference. And it's a personal thing. I don't go around telling people, apostolizing and telling people, you must be vegetarian like me. That doesn't really work enough. And, you know, I do have a small platform and I hope that perhaps I, perhaps through influencing in my small platform, for, for example, this is very important to me. Satish, you've just spoken so passionately and it's so, um, you know, it's fierce. This is fierce. Mm -hmm. When Satish talks about something radical, he has lived, you have lived an incredibly radical life. I mean, my green footprint is appalling as a musician because we've had to use transport. We've had to fly everywhere. We've had to go in huge trucks. And it's kind of put, put everything into question. And as an older person now, you know, I'm not really touring and doing those sort of things that I might feel terribly guilty about in some kind of way. But it's, you know, the modern, comfortable uh, things that we can use that are convenience products, they're, they're kind of fantastic, really. That's the problem. We're kind of all bound into it. Satish is going to now take, take that line and tell us 
really what we can do. But I mean, if it was one thing, honestly, Pamela, I would say probably becoming vegetarian and, yeah. you know, just, just not eating red meat. Is it maybe my one thing, my one change? Yeah. Obviously, I do believe that, you know, the ocean is made out of infinite drops of ind individual drops of water. I do believe that. And so, you know, maybe maybe that has that has some kind of influence. But I live with despair. I do live with despair because I'm anxious, dreadfully anxious about this future. You know, every day I'm just like, oh, my God, we're stuck. We're stuck. That's how I feel. But that's a huge contribution you made, Annie, you know, to say you become vegetarian and don't underestimate uh, the influence and encouragement that will give to so many people around the world. Satish, um, I'm just I can't wait to hear what have you done personally I to mean, change your lifestyle? I, I think Annie's example is marvellous. Plant based diet. I follow that. Mm. All my family, my wife, my two children, my grandchild, granddaughter, we are all eating plant-based vegetarian diet. And I think 30 to 40% of our carbon emission is generated by, uh, by meat industry. And the amount of water we use and the amount of land we use is colossal. And therefore, if we can have this example, like Annie has set, set the example, and I follow that example. I'm also completely vegetarian, and and you follow uh, plant plant based diet, and so if we if people can reduce their meat consumption, that would be a great contribution to the uh, question of the crisis of climate change. But also, I would like to say the another thing which I do m much more uh, is walking. If we can walk to work, if we can walk to our library, if we can walk to our uh, doctor's uh, surgery, if we can walk to our uh, schools, wherever we have to go, if we can have a walking distance and walk more and use less cars and less trains and less aeroplanes, because transportation is another great contributor to climate uh, catastrophe and climate crisis. And therefore, I practice walking as much as I can. And, and more I walk is not only good for the environment and good for the climate change, but it's good for the mind. My mind is more healthy um, and my body is much more exercised. So for my personal um, life, for my mental health and for the health of society and for the health of the planet, walking is another good example that I try to practice and I try and I hope that other people can also follow. So eating a plant-based diet is my practice and walking more is my practice. And you know, these are, these are examples we can all follow. Eating a more vegetarian diet and walking. They're not difficult to do. And so that's, thank you so much for sharing these. Mm. COP26 is upon us. Um, we know there are lots of vested interests, by the way, uh, in the meat industry, for example, uh, that make these, these real challenges to encourage people towards a vegetarian diet and, and to have a more healthy lifestyle. But COP26 is upon us now. What does it need to deliver? And are you hopeful, Annie? I mean, this is dreadful because you put me on the spot. I mean, <laughs> I've, I have been able personally to make some small contributions in, in small ways to this event. And, and, the, and that's, I'm always looking for ways to, to contribute wherever I can, you know, and that's, that's really my life is based on that, just making contributions wherever I can to help to amplify messaging. But, you know, talking is very, very important. Having conversations like the one we have um, is very important. We just have to keep that kind of energy going. But of course, the basic thing is action. And, and you know, I mean, the thing about COP26 is that everyone is focused upon it. Afterwards, when everyone leaves, you know, you, one has to walk one's talk. And that is when the challenge will arise. And my concern, and I will just put this to us all, is, you know, large, if large countries such as India and China, for example, do not get on board with really genuinely trying to reduce their emissions, for example, we're in real jeopardy. And so, I mean, I'm very, very happy, you know, and encouraged that such a phenomenon is taking place. And I'm very proud that it's happening in Scotland. And I'm very, very proud of our university in, in terms that, you know, we are very uh, involved in, in that ethical sense. But I, I really have this 
dreadful, dreadful sense because, I mean, of late, the, of the latest UN report that, you know, it says, and I'm reading now, I quote, we are missing the opportunity to build back better from, you know, our, our you know, COVID pandemic. There was a catchphrase that's build back better. If we, if we don't, we face disastrous temperature rises of at least 2.7 centigrade if countries fail to make their climate pledges. Now that is really sobering. So it's not about the talk, it's actually about meeting the pledges. Now, I'll put, I'll, yeah. it remains to be seen, let's put it to you like that. Thank you, Annie. And Satish, what do you hope to see from COP and are you hopeful for the future? Yes, I am hopeful. I'm hopeful partly because of the younger generation is raising their voice. Greta Thunberg is a good example, but there are hundreds of thousands of young people around the world, India, China, America, Europe, Africa, everywhere are walking and asking for a change of policy and asking for do something, action, not just words, but action. And that gives me hope. And I hope that um, the leaders uh, of the world who are meeting at Glasgow, and I'm delighted that the meeting is happening in Scotland, in Glasgow. That's wonderful, um, a small, beautiful country, Scotland. I hope that the leaders can rise and transcend about their self-interest and think of the common interest of our common home, this planet Earth. We have only one planet home. We don't have any other planet. There's no planet B. The only one planet we have. If we ruin it, there's, you can go to Mars, you can go to Moon, you can go to anywhere. You will not find a beautiful, wonderful, amazing, marvelous planet Earth as we have here. This is heaven and we are destroying it. And we use the energy from the hell, the dark energy from the underworld, the coal, the gas, the oil. We have to stop that. And we have to use the energy from heaven, which is the sun and the wind and, and the rain and the water. So if energy coming from the heaven, which is free and available to everybody, we can create heaven on earth. If we continue to use the energy from the hell, from the underworld, the coal and the gas and the oil, we will create this earth into hell. So my hope for the Glasgow um, the COP26 is that the leaders will forget their self-interest, narrow national interest, and unite together to, to save and protect our common home, this planet home, planet Earth. Dr. Lennox, Dr. Kumar, what a stirring and important conversation you have had together tonight. From dread to hope. Um, we must all now, as you have both said, move forward. After COP is long gone behind us uh, to take actions. Um, I wish you both the very best in the wide range of endeavours that you both engaged in uh, to raise awareness of this issue and to take action that will protect the, our planet and everything that lives in our planet. Thank you both so much for joining us uh, for this GCU COP26 Common Good podcast. It has been eye-opening. Thank you both so much. Good night. <laughs>